Good morning, everyone. It's good to have you with us as we come together to worship the Lord our God. As far as announcements go, we have just a couple of things to bring to your attention, and that is that the officers will meet Tuesday night at 7 o'clock here at the church. So if you have anything to bring to our attention or you'd like to come and sit in on a meeting, feel free to do so. That'll be Tuesday night here at 7 o'clock. And then on the 18th, which is Saturday, we'll have a poor man's supper and a movie at 6 o'clock in our fellowship hall. That's always fun as well. And uh, then on the 30th, Andy Griffith Bible Study. We haven't been able to do one of those, th especially through the summer and the busy holiday season. So it would be good to have Andy Griffith again as well. <clears throat> I've been running up and down the aisle. I feel like I'm out of breath. I'm going to have to start doing something and get back in shape. <laughs> Maybe I need to talk to Jackie and figure his secret out. Now he'd run off and leave me, though. <laughs> As far as uh, our prayer list goes, i got a couple of additions for that as well, please. Uh, remember Bobby, he's homesick with a virus, and we know how all those go. We've uh, heard a lot of viruses and so on going on lately, so please remember Bobby. Miss Annette Porter is at home now, I understand, even though she's uh, going through still battling cancer. Please remember Miss Porter. Um, and then Minnie Lou's daughter's mother-in-law is having to be put in a nursing home and the family struggling with that. So please remember that. That is a difficult decision. So please remember with them. Also, Steve Lemons, who we've been praying for his surgery. I think the surgery went all right, but now he's got pneumonia. So pray, pray for Steve. And then Leonard's struggling as well. So please remember Leonard as he, uh, he goes through these days and uh, still struggling from his recovery, from his heart surgery. Please pray for Leonard. I think that's all I have, unless you have some other things, or we need more comments on these. That's right. We're glad to have Mr. Mooney back with us this morning. I know he's undergone some difficult times as well. So uh, we thank God that he's able to be back with us this morning. Yeah, and had beautiful weather to come over too, didn't you? It's, it's beautiful out this morning. So uh, always good to have a praise report. We see God's hand at work in those things. That's true. Uh, if there's nothing else then, let's look to our God in prayer as we start this morning. Let's pray. Our Father, again, we do thank you so much that by your hand you have brought us here this morning. You have blessed us in so many ways, God. You're so worthy of our assembling together and coming and worshiping you. Father, as we think of our life this week and see the wonderful things you did for us, we can't help but come and praise you for those things. Now be with us as we worship. May everything we do please you and glorify you. And Father, we again thank you that you've given us wonderful songs to sing, that you have given us your word that we can read and meditate upon. And Father, also for prayer, a wonderful tool that we can come before your throne and just pour our hearts out before you. And we thank you that you have taught us how to pray. Now be with us as we pray that prayer together your son taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever. Amen. This morning our call to worship again will come from Psalms 1, the first three verses of Psalms 1. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. He is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither. And all that he does, he prospers. Well, we're glad to see Wanda back. I know Edna is. She was... Yeah, everything but go out in the yard and dance, knowing that she uh, that Wanda's coming back. But I'm glad to, glad to see her. Let's turn your Bibles to Isaiah chapter 60, beginning with verse one. That's Isaiah chapter 60, beginning with verse one. Let's hear what the Word of God has to say for us this morning. I'll be reading from the NIV version. Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord rises upon you. See, darkness covers the earth, and thick dark darkness is over the people. 
But the Lord rises upon you, and His glory appears over you. Nations will come to your light, and kings to the brightness of your dawn. Lift up your eyes and look ab about you. All assembled and come to you. Your sons come from afar, and your daughters are carried on their hip. Then you will look and be radiant. Your heart will throb and swell with joy. The wealth of the, the seas will be brought to you. To you the riches of the nations will come. Herds of camels will come over your land, young camels of Midian and Ephah, and all from Sheba will come, bearing gold and incense, proclaiming the praise of the Lord. Thanks be reading to God's Word. Empathy was what we are going to talk about this morning. It's 12 days of Christmas. This is when the uh, Magi's that uh, came to see Christ after Christ was born. This is uh, the Magi's, of course, are Gentiles. And uh, they come to, to see this wonderful, wonderful gift that God has given us. And the uh, epithy is that saying, they're exposing like, wow, this is something great. This is a shining and showing the deity of our Lord and Christ. Now, this past week, we launched into this season, and it's the time in the church calendar that uh, the community of faith celebrates the visits of these Magi's. Uh, they witness the, the, in the stable in the Bethlehem the manifestation of God and in the birth of the babe Jesus Christ. So they were witnesses here after the fact. Now, the, the visits would be a little bit of callous for slaughter and, and flight. And you're thinking, what? We just got through the Christmas season and we've seen the beautiful pageantry of God's uh, gift, the, the birth of Christ. We, we see the homeless, the angels, we see the beauty, and we see all this wonderful beauty. But we often don't think about genocide, infanticide, political uh, uh, refuge being connected in some way with the story of Christmas, do we? We kind of block that out, and, and yes, there is a, a right in the middle of our gospel text is all of this stuff, but we kind of look over it and look at the beauty and see the, the angels and the pageantry of it instead of seeing that these things is happening, this darkness around Jesus' birth. We often tame the stories that somehow we miss reading or understanding the context of this. Now, the writer wants us to clearly know that Jesus was born into a world where slaughter and death was a reality. Sounds like our world, doesn't it? Slaughter and death is a reality. How many of us seen on the news this past Christmas where people were killing one another in families over Christmas things? Getting in fights, hurting and killing to get to the best offer in some of these stores. This is what Jesus is talking about. The same thing. Maybe they didn't have Walmart and all this stuff here back then, of course. But the same things was happening in our world today as it was as Jesus was being born. The slaughter and death. He wants us to know that Jesus and his families were political refugees in flight from persecution. They had to go from one city to the other to get away from King Herod because he wanted to kill them. If he had found the baby Jesus, he wanted to slaughter the baby Jesus. And what did he do with children two and under? He slaughtered them. We forget about these things during Christmas times because we're caught up in the light and the pageantry. The same thing that happened back then is happening nowadays. When we say, how can someone do this on Christmas? How can someone do this when Jesus was born? So what Christ is telling us is no difference. And we might have better technology. We might get places faster. We have lights. We have all this wonderful things that God has blessed us with. But man never changes. As humans, we don't change. Our mindset is the same thing. That's the real backdrop for the Christ event. It's not all sweetness and light. In fact, God's actions in the world... Sometimes it's not, is it? God can do a praise and wonderful thing in the world, and the world turns around, and it's slaughtering and killing, and it goes on. 
that are meant with disbelief, holocaust, and agony. And the coming of Jesus' birth as a baby in a manger brought forth conditions not all like or unlike what we face in our modern, modern world. But there are same, same things. We still have the same thing. We still have the evilness in our world. Back then, there were the poor. We have the poor, the refugees, the hungry, the disease, and the disenfranchisement. We have this now. They had it back then. We got it now. The world was in tension and strife and uncertainty. What about our world today? Is it in strife and uncertainty? Yes, around the globe. Not just here. Isaiah's words seem to clearly describe the situation they faced. I'll read part here. It says, The glory of the Lord has risen upon you, for darkness shall cover the earth, and thick darkness the people. It was a dark time back then. And there's nothing changed now. We see in dark times now. But Jesus is saying, Be of good cheer, because I am with you. I know what you're going through. And this is important for us to understand, for the same pain and agony we experience around us today was also at the presence of Jesus Christ when He was born. It was there too. So there's nothing new from way back then. Because a lot of people like to say, gosh, that's way back then. They didn't have them problems. They did have those problems. And we hear ourselves saying, you know, back when we was growing up in church, we didn't do this, do that. And we had more going on and things like this. Yes, we did. But there were still the same things going on. It's just we heard less about it, didn't we? Technology now, if you blow your nose, they can hear it around the world in one second. So you see, there's no difference. Essentially, epiphany means that our Lord came into the world for all people. That the gospel is good news. He came to the world for all people. It's universal in its scope. We sometimes like to limit that. We like to limit to Jesus Christ only in the United States or only in our community or only in our church. We like to limit that. We forget that Jesus came for all. That the church is not a sect or group limited to particular cultures or lifestyles that you have to go through. That Jesus came not because of us, but He came to save the world. The whole world. Everyone. The church is for all people. No one is left out. Our church is for all people. This is God's church. The doors is open for all people, no matter who they are, to walk through this door. Christ is a picture of humankind. Not our sins, but of humankind. Do you think Jesus would select this person and walk over this other person and only came for maybe this person and not all the others? Jesus came. He says, my door is open. No one is left out. If you come in to praise me, the door is open. He's not just an American, Chinese, Jewish, Arabian, African, Latin American. Jesus was born a Jew. Yes, he was Jewish. But the blood of Adam and the whole human race runs through the veins of Jesus Christ. If Jesus just was, was just born the Jewish and only took care of the Jewish people, guess what? We'd be in trouble, wouldn't we? I know I don't look Jewish. I'll see you out there look Jewish. But Jesus came for all people, no matter who they are. There's a sense in which we understand that Christianity is humanity. And that's what it's supposed to be. Humanity. The event in which by our lives become human. Become human. Now Christ is not an idea in our heads, is He? A lot of people like to think that, oh, He's just an imagination. I've, I had this conversation with people before. They don't believe in Jesus Christ. They don't believe in anything as far as religion goes. They will take this 
movie that's been produced for quite a few years uh, from an atheist and take everything that that person says and says, wow, yeah, I believe in that because he's telling about, oh, a God wouldn't do that. He wouldn't let a loved one pass. He wouldn't let a loved one do this. He wouldn't have a war right here. He wouldn't have to let all these things happen if it was a true God. So they got people thinking that there's no such thing as God because if we're preaching a loving and wonderful God, then why is God doing this? And this is the mindset that, that Satan will take and take our young people and even people of old and turn their minds around and saying, there is no God because what kind of loving God will let this happen? Tragic things are going to happen in our lives. All through time and through God's Word and other histories, bad things happen. Who do we blame? We want to blame God, but you know what? A lot of these actions are upon ourselves. A lot of things that we've done and created is our own selves. Destruction. Gunpowder. Gunpowder was really invented for a healing. They would put on wounds and stop bleedings and stuff like that. And someone said, wow, we can take that stuff and then go boom. The next thing you know, we're killing each other. Now, how can we blame God for our own actions of just killing and being evil? Now, he is real, and He can meet with us in any situation. God is real because we feel it. Not just by feelings, not by emotions, but we feel the Spirit of God. He may be met when we take our Holy Communion. We feel that special spirit coming over us. Maybe one of our church's dinner that we're going to have. The fellowship that we have with one another. We feel the Spirit of God there with us, the Spirit of Christ, because we're showing our love for one another. Jesus is there. Remember the first time you met Him? I do, and I'll never forget it. That's something you don't forget. Have you ever met a character or someone in your life before and, and you maybe hadn't seen them in 50 years, but that person made an impression on you? And you said, yes, I remember him. I remember he made this right. He was the best teacher maybe. Maybe as a teacher in the first grade or second grade that did something that really impressed you. And you never forgot it. So how would you forget Jesus Christ coming into your life? You will remember it always. And what the joy it brought to your life. It was great, wasn't it? That joy that came into your life. It might not have been like a road to Damascus, but you felt it. When you're reading God's words by yourself sometimes, you're sitting there and you feel the Spirit of God come upon you and you're saying, gosh, I didn't know that. Thank you, Lord, for letting me understand this. Or when you're in your deepest, deepest, depressed way and someone comes by to visit with you. Just to talk with you. Maybe just to sit with you. You feel the Spirit of Christ there. Jesus may be met in the face of any person ever born. The modern person of, of cybernetics, the peasant, farmer, the homeless person, a person living in the flop house, skid row, a person dying of AIDS, a CEO, or the person sitting next to you in the pew this morning. Every person has that potential in Christ empathy to show that wonderful Savior that we have, that spirit filling God's presence the Lord and Savior's presence with you right this moment. When you feel this presence, it's a presence of joy and happiness. Yes, the world is corrupt. The world's got darkness. And, and even Isaiah talks about the darkness comes thick upon people. And that means a lot of evil upon people. If you notice he said evil upon across the world and also evil 
dark evilness among people. Yes, they're out there. They're out there everywhere. But the joy of Christ is in your heart. We see things, but we also feel things. These are just some reflective thoughts about the Christ who manifests himself before us. I happen to believe that people are meeting this Christ everywhere. All over the world and under the strangest circumstances, people are meeting Christ. We might not see it. We might not hear about in the news about this person found Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. I think the news ought to just have that, don't you? They show everything else. They show everything from the worst thing in the world. They want nothing but evilness they want to show. What about showing the people that found Christ in their life? Every time someone around the world that experienced Jesus Christ in their life, it comes across the news flash. We have an update here. Here we are. John Doe here has found Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. That's everybody right now rejoice. Wouldn't that be some wonderful news to hear on the TV around the world? All the people around the world under some of the strangest circumstances will find Christ. And they may not know it. And they may not always call him by the right name. But there's no way to escape his loving and transforming presence. You say, you mean they might not know him? They might not know Christ. Something, they, they might have never had Christ in their life before and all of a sudden something comes over them. Some kind of joy and loving. They've heard the word of God, the gospel. God has planted a seed there, and all of a sudden, a light goes on. Hallelujah. So this is God. This is Jesus Christ that's coming into my life. What a wonderful joy. What is this joy coming over me? Is it, is this, is it feeling? Is it what? And they might not know it. And they might not even know what name to call this Jesus Christ. Some of our third world countries around the world that might accept and feel and see the Spirit coming upon Him and really not know what it is. But there's no way to escape His loving, transforming presence. You can't run and hide. But His loving, transforming presence in your life. Remember? Remember when he transformed himself in you? I do. I remember the first time that after Christ transformed himself into me, the first time that I walked into a church after that happened, it was overwhelming. People probably thought I was kind of schizo or something, you know, and I walked up and tears going down my eyes and the service hadn't even started yet. It was just a power that Christ had in me and the first time to walk in God's church and to have that power that He put upon me and that love to walk in those doors to see the beautiful church. I can almost see the angels around in that church floating. Hallelujah. That's what I'm talking about. That's what I'm talking about. The love of Christ when He comes upon you. The empathy. He is always there. It is true that people are not flocking, flocking to be part of a church now in order to meet this Christ who manifests itself to Him. We know that. But it's alright. Because we're going to let God do His work. And there's no need to be alarmed for the church. The people of God is not a passing social entity, is it? It's not going away. We're not going away by the side. The church is okay. God will make sure the church is all right. The church is embedded in every structural and reality, and not even the power of so-called evil can destroy that. If evil could destroy the Christian people right now, we wouldn't be sitting here today, would we? Thousands and thousands of years ago it's been tried. And God stands. Epiphany tells us that one can be in the church and not really know and articulate it. 
be sitting in church and just not even know it about the power of Christ coming into you and all of a sudden hit you. Likewise, one can thirst for baptism and not understand the reason for the thirst. I know when I was first baptized like that, uh, they told me it was having some kind of candy up front. I was little. My friends, they were cruel. <laughs> well, I was easy one. They told me, he said, go up front. So they're going to give him some candy out. You got to go up there. And I went up there and was to be baptized. They said, oh, yeah, yay, Jerry's going to be baptized. I'm sitting there saying, I'm going to be what? Where's the candy? But I didn't know the reason, but God had that reason. And a lot of times when we say we get caught up in emotions and come up to, to be baptized and to have these activities, sometimes we don't understand it. But you know what? God understands it. And later on down the road, I understood it. What a person would know is when a true encounter with Christ takes place, that meeting, however it is accomplished, you would know it. You will feel free and you will feel human. You will have compassion and you'll have love in your heart. You will feel you united with sisters and brothers, wherever they are, and you will feel peaceful at home with yourself. That's the Spirit of God. That's the Lord Jesus in you. When you feel that, when you sit at home, and no matter what happens in your home, you feel the presence of Christ there. I know that the church, the community of faith, is such a place for encounters, for meeting Jesus the Christ. That's what we're here for. It is an arena in which humanity may be identified and reunited with each other. That is why no particular group with limited concerns or taking over the church and this group over here, is, you see it all the time where you got two groups fighting back and forth. Actually, in an Andy Griffith movie that we'll be seeing this week has that in the church. I really want you to see that because it's, uh, it's, 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 it's really it's funny, but yet it's, it's reality in some churches. But the church, meaning you and me, is where Christ is met and true humanity recovers. The church is not the building. It's us. It seems to us that people of God and the whole human race, the family of men, women, and children, it kind of stings a little bit that we don't recognize a lot of Christ's spirit in us. It's kind of like the leaves rustling on the trees. We can hear in the dead winter, you, you can hear the wind blowing and you hear the, the leaves. You don't know which leaf it is, but it catches you. You hear it. It's a kind of a easy, loving, soothing spirit. And that's what Jesus is. A soothing, loving spirit. So this past empathy, epiphany, is a time to lift our deity, Jesus Christ, up and feel that spirit in each one of us. May that spirit be with you today and forever. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I want to thank you for your blessings, your spirit. We ask, Father, that you may comfort us, give us peaceful minds, that we may feel that spirit with us everywhere we go. Thank you, Lord, for your blessings. Thank you for this church, this community. We ask, Father, for your spirit to be with us in Jesus' name. Amen.